Hello, you are listening to and are watching our podcast called Wormhole Pinball Presents. And today I'm very excited to be joined by Carrie Hardy. Welcome to the Wormhole Virtually, Carrie. Thanks so much. Hello, and thanks for having me. Um, so I'm in Houston. Where are you in Texas? I'm up here in Sherman, basically about an hour north of Dallas. Okay. Is your family from here? Uh, yeah, we've been been in Texas pretty much all my life. I mean, so that's that's yeah, ma majority of them are here in Texas. A uh, small portion of my family is in Arizona, and a little bit's in Philadelphia. It's a different world, Texas, isn't? It? Yeah, luckily. <laughs> it is though, because I it was a culture shock for my wife and I. We met in Central Florida, but I'm from New York and she's from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And we moved to Florida in '97, and the first week of us moving here was uh, Go Texan Day, which is a know what that day is. Yeah, it's a big day in Houston, right, for the rodeo. Okay. For the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, so they people wear their cowboy hats to the office. It's uh, like a Friday. It'll be Go Texan Day. And then with the big belt buckles and stuff. And my wife calls me on my cell phone in 97. I had a cell in 97. I was hot shit. And, uh, rich. No, I was a recruit. I was a recruiter. Oh, okay. And I needed, you know, to call candidates all the time. So, uh, she calls me up and she's like, What did, where did you move me? They're all wearing belt buckles. I'm wearing like a dress from Ann Klein. It's just, so I, I think it's a, a misconception for a lot of people is they think that we all wear like 10 gallon hats and cowboy boots and big old belt buckles and stuff like that. It's totally not, at least in my area. Right. Fort Worth is more commonly, you're going to see more of that, but, um, like Dallas and majority of us actually don't walk around looking like that wearing stuff. Well, our first day of Texas, we thought you did. <laughs> like, what the hell are we? What do we do? Like, but, I, I got a good amount of my coworkers that actually moved from California to here in the last five or six years. A great deal of them actually went from California to here where I'm located. And uh, they said it was one of the best things that they've done. Uh, just a much better place in comparison, I guess, the way direction that that state's headed in their, in their mind. No, look, I love Texas. I raised two Texan boys. I have a Texan grandson. I mean, I'm I'm in love with the joint. I just, you know, when we moved here, it was like massive culture shock for us. Um, all right, let's get to it. Uh, you can uh, find Carrie heavily on YouTube. Uh, I carry Hardy. When I was prepping for this interview, I delved a little deeper into some of your bods. And, and you, when were you first posting on YouTube? Uh, let's see. I had the YouTube channel since uh maybe 2011 whenever its conception was because i had an account so i could watch videos on youtube and i would post like some gaming videos or stuff like that that i had done like for battlefield 2 a long time ago and then eventually i had some other little things here and there just nothing serious or anything to try to like grow a channel or anything like that. I, that didn't start until like 2018. I want to say that's when okay. I decided to actually, you know, let's, let's dedicate this to pinball kind of thing. It was, uh, my first YouTube. So I delved into YouTube earlier before pinball and, uh, I had a channel called waiting for my Tesla. Um, I was a first day reservation holder for the model three. And I got a VIN number and it just took from VIN number to getting your car out of California. It was like, it wound up being like three months, four months. So I started buying all these extra add-ons for a Tesla that I didn't own. And then I was doing product reviews on like products, like, you know, a charger bank or wireless charger, all this crap I was buying for a Tesla that I didn't own. And I called it waiting for my Tesla. And I was getting like thousands and thousands of views because it was such a stupid concept. And then, uh, once I got the car, I, I just let it go. I was bored with it because I already got, the, I got the car. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I like started like doing, uh, videos when it comes to like you know, streaming and putting them on YouTube or Twitch or whatever, 
it was like video game based. I would be playing different types of video games. And for those that don't know, it's a very saturated uh, area of YouTube as people play video games and you get to watch them and everything. But I think uh, I started with a series. It was like Call of Duty, World at War or whatever. And that stuff's still out there and you can find it. Uh, maybe eventually I'll share it if people want to see me play video games or whatever, my commentary about it. I thought I was funny, but you know, it's, that's, it, it is what it is. But it's one of those things where, to me, gaming and recording and editing those videos, it seemed more like work than fun or anything. My passion was is not really into video games. It's like, yeah, I do that as a you know, little side thing here and there, just a little stress reliever or whatever, just something to do. But my passion really was in the hobby of pinball. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I just do what I do with pinball, whether it repairs or whatever, and just record and edit that. I mean, and then that basically turned what was work into just something that is just fun to do, a passion kind of. Yeah. So look, I did this no longer work. Was your like first foray in the pinball content, the Back to the Future Restoration Project? Uh, no, it was actually in X Files. Okay. I got I got that machine, and um, it was one of those for a location. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, you know what? I, I think I probably have some early videos of Back to the Future, but it wasn't like you know going through the whole process of everything. Whereas I believe X Files was the first time where I was like, I'm going to show you you know, some of the stuff that I do. And it was more of a refurbished and a restoration or anything. And I look back at it now and I did a horrible job with the LEDs on it. I mean, it's, it's so bad. And it's just like, it's like, oh man, I would not do a game like that today. And the thing is that X-Files is actually on the location near me. He, he has it and I, I play it and I'm like, I'm sorry about your LED job, man. I really wish I would have done something a little bit better than what's currently on there. It was a kit. It was like, I bought a kit that was already assembled, so the GI is probably like blues and purples or whatever and stuff, and it's just like, oh, so bad. Do you remember your first shift from maybe in content where you went from like a pinball restoration project to just giving your opinions on on a mic? I want to say it might have been Black Knight, Sword of Rage, if I had to guess, because... I would have to look back at it, and I mean, and I still do the restorations, but I think when it came to, like, you know, commentary on the hobby. Right. Because it's different, right? It, it's a different, you could hide behind a restoration rather than, you know, you sitting on camera and talking about recording yourself alone, discussing pinball topics and what you think about it. It's, it's just a different type of stream. It's 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 different because, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like definitely if you're going to commentate on a particular hobby that everybody's interested in, then you need to be well-educated on it as well. You can't just get into the hobby and think you know about the history of it, and you need to learn who the designers of these particular games are, the history that they have. There's a lot of things that you need to educate yourself on if you feel like that you're going to be at least accepted by the pinball community for talking about it. And that's something that I think some people need to understand is that uh, the people in this hobby, just because you come in gunslinging, people are going to look at you like, we don't know who you are. You kind of had to build up a trust with some of these people. And, and I'm still doing that to this day. I mean, there's just there's some people that you can't please. But it's definitely you have to, you know, earn, you know, whether it be a reputation or a trust within the people in this hobby kind of thing. You can only play the new card for so long, mm -hmm. right? I played the new card a lot when we started Wormhole, uh, and, you know, I didn't know who anybody was. And I I could get away with it, right, you know, because it was COVID, so I can get away with it for a little bit, but eventually I had to figure out who the hell everyone is, so that's okay. It's a, it's a, it's a lot to learn, and it, it, you basically have to make this hobby a portion of your life, a part of your life. And yeah. the, the joy about that is that you end up meeting other people that enjoy it just as much as you, if not more. And that's what the whole joyful part of like these shows, like Texas Pinball Festival and Expo and stuff like that, is that you get to meet other people that feel just as passionately about this as you do. And so as we're talking pinball speak and using acronyms or whatever talking about certain things 
Whereas I tried doing that with my wife and she just, her eyes glaze over and she's like, I don't know what you're talking about kind of thing. And so this is a point for just a lot of us that really enjoy the hobby just to go back and forth. And it's just like, it's just, I don't know. It's just therapeutic in a way. It It, it is to me, you know, I, my wife is not into pinball. She doesn't really care, but she loves the wormhole and she loves, you know, Tim and Christine who, uh, Lona and John. So we have events here and she bartends. She's like, look, I'm not going to play pinball. I'm just going to bartend. So we call her the bartender and that's, you know, she, that's her contribution and she's really damn good at it. She does all the merch and stuff. So it, she, we're slowly pulling her in, Carrie. <laughs> And like, I've been doing this for over a decade and it's like the wife, she's there for it. You know, she's all for me doing my thing. As long as I always put the family first and I'm not losing money, then she's all for it kind of thing. So when was there a video where you came to them and said, I'm on to something? Do you remember that point? Yeah, there was never a point. I'm still at that point where I don't think I'm onto something or anything. It, it's, I don't, I, I don't, I think probably my first, I guess, it video the one that i guess got the most traction was the one where i added i did a bar and find and we found that adam's family and people got this and you know it's kind of traumatic for people to see all these games that have just been sitting out in the weather and have just turned into just god-awful mess yeah like over a decade of weather changes in texas so i think that was definitely kind of what people watch not for me but just because they watched it because they it's just it's sad it's like that some people just let these things sit out and fester away and i think that was one of my first videos that i guess got the most interests and views that's awesome let's pivot to uh tpf you did a podcast with the pinball network which i just listened to uh we kind of went through every machine so i don't want to do that again because that's i mean you could download the uh the tpm podcast that was what uh, flipping out and friends Yes. Oh, was that on YouTube or is it on? It's, I think it went to multiple, but I believe it is on YouTube. Yes. I even, I think I posted the link on my community page on YouTube. All right. So I have a few questions that may not have been covered on that show. How about that? Okay. Um, they really, homebrews were a huge kind of hit in 2024. Um, did you get a chance to play every one of those homebrews or? I really wish that I could have. Um, and this was something that I think was a big game changer this year when it comes to the homebrews is because a lot of us that bring a game for competition purposes and everything. So like this year, I brought my Earthshaker and a lot of my friends, they bring other games that they've restored and cleaned up. They bring them, you know, for the, the competition wise of that. And we never looked at homebrew as being a competitor. We looked at it as its own separate category because there is an award for home best homebrew and stuff like that. We just never thought that that was going to be something that we were going to have to compete against. And so this year when, you know, Friday the 13th game won best of show, I mean, the rest of us that have won best of show looked at each other and said that this has changed. Like, like the game has just changed for us kind of thing. And I was like, by all means, those that, have built their own game or done this, they put in more work than a lot of us that are just basically making what someone has already created pretty again. Whereas they're like creating all kinds of like new mechs or a new way to plunge and a, a custom topper, custom art where, I mean, and, and I can, it's incredible. Yeah. I'm completely aware that they put in much more time and effort than I do on just making something that used to look pretty, pretty again. And so by looking at a lot of these games, I mean, for those that do just restore games and not make our own, there's definitely a moment of like, man, they put a lot of work into this. So I, I required a lot of effort on their end and stuff like that. So looking at these games, it, it, I am impressed at the amount of untapped talent that we have within this hobby. And I feel that every year, more and more people with this talent are getting into it. And it's just a matter of which manufacturer is going to grab this untapped talent to reel them in kind of thing. Yeah. Have, would you ever consider building a homebrew yourself? Uh, I'm not against it. Uh, it's just like, I know that it would require a great deal of work and finesse 
especially yeah. when it comes to like uh, woodworking and everything. I would really like to get a, like a CNC uh, machine to do a lot of this cutting and stuff like that. Because if I'm going to be doing it with a hand drill and I'm one of those where I measure like six times and cut six times as well kind of thing. And it's just never going to be good, especially for a white wood. So I would have to like, I would definitely have to lean heavily on those that have done their own machine. So that way they could help me out. Cause I, I would be, be going in and just not knowing what to do next kind of thing. John uh, Spates, one of the worm haulers was walked through there with me and he just goes, all right, we got to do our own boom pen. We got to do our own home pen. And I was like, man, we have, cause we have tech Wednesday and we have the three tournaments here a month and these machines just get beat up on, you know, 30, 40, 50 people come in and we have this board of grievances. So Wednesday is the board of grievances of with what we've got to fix. And I'm like, we just don't have time to build a machine from scratch. And then all the people I'd want to get involved with, like a team, they already work for Barrels of Fun here in Houston. So it's like, they don't want to make machines during the day. Yeah. And then come and go, hey, you guys want to make a machine on the office? <laughs> right, that is not going to work. <laughs> and that's the thing. I think that's one of the main, basically, catalysts for those that are making their own machine is that they want to create a machine based on a theme that they know that a big manufacturer is not going to make it. And not just that they're not going to make it, but they're going to make it and they're not going to do it justice. There's going to be a lot of things that they're just not going to be able to get licenses on or they're not going to create certain things in there because of cost restraints. Whereas someone has enough passion behind the office or anything that they're going to be like, you know what? I want every funny call out there is in the show. I want all these segments and it's mine. I can do what I want kind of thing. We're not out there selling the machines to the masses so they can essentially create a one-off and do what they want. So that's what I really like about it also is that you're going to see people that are going, you know, no one's doing this thing. And I would really like to see this in a machine. Yeah. You know, people with that talent and the passion behind it bring this stuff to life. And it's like, Yes, that's awesome kind of thing. You were talking about your Earthshaker earlier. I, I got a chance to really check that out. That was absolutely beautiful. That's the quickest I've ever turned a game around. Uh, it was one of those where, like, the amount of videos that I was putting out that I typically do, I, I typically do maybe a video a week. Uh, that one, the, for the course of the two months that I was really hardcore, I didn't even know it was going to make it to TPF or not. It was bad. I mean, one small hiccup is something that I would do, whether it be putting the decals down and they just don't go down very well, or if I drop something into dents this or messes this up, I mean, we're out having to wait on something to be shipped to me. I honestly did not know if it was going to make it to the show. I was like, it was like, I, I, it was down to the wire. I literally finished the game and like play tested it the Tuesday of TPF week. So it was one of those where I'm like, I, I, I hope everything works. I don't know even know how well it shoots and who knows if like things are going to go wrong. And a couple of things did go wrong because I didn't have enough time to really thoroughly play test it, especially with a shaker motor in it. That's what really highlighted anything that wasn't soldered very well or screwed down very well, but it, yeah, it moved it's our weekend. I mean, it, that's a testament, right? Cause that got banged on. Yeah. That every TPF, that's the thing about the homebrew section also. I mean, if you want something like to really test how well your game is built, bring it to a show for the weekend. You're like, you know what? I got a homebrew game. I want to see if it's going to survive. Bring it to TPF or Expo or something like that where it's just someone after another continuously hitting that start button, getting those coils all nice and hot. That is, you will get tested, all right? You will get tested on that kind of thing. It was weird because this year at TPF, they wouldn't give the, the badges until they play tested your game. <laughs> and we brought four, five, and one of them, uh, Cosmic Princess, behind me, uh, blew a coil. So when they were play testing it, and there's not like you can get a stern Australian coil. <laughs> so we, you, it was blown away how many people found one and brought one to us. I, I don't even know how they did it. 
That's the great thing I enjoy about it. I, I can't speak for Expo because I don't bring games to Expo. I bring games to TPF, but there's definitely everyone that brings a game is looking out for everyone else that brought a game. Yeah. If you need a coil, if you need help with something, every time one of us had to lift the play field up, we were there going, what do you need? What do you need this tool? What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Just helping each other out, whatever we had to do to get the games back and fully functioning so people could play and begin. We got each other's backs. Even though we were in competition with one another, we still want to help each other out because we know that it's a frustrating thing to have to work on something in the middle of a show and we want everybody to be able to have all the games functioning and that was one of the principles of why they put into place the whole testing to make sure that the games were playable, working, and also safe by making sure that they're... Yeah, I had no problem with it. I thought it was really great. Uh, this way someone doesn't bring a jalopy, right? Yeah, and that and that happens. And it, it's like last year, not this one we just had, but I think 2023 was probably the worst when it comes to people bringing a known bad game. Yeah. I mean, like the, there's time, there's, I know things happen in transit to where it's like, oh, you know, this came loose, this connector, what sure. loose solder joint. It happens. I'm, Every time you move a pinball machine, something something even from one side of the room to the next like what happened dude we've got a bonsai run that's been sitting there since 2020 and we won't move it because we're afraid of the magnet because yeah. it's such a rare little you can't replace that on the upper play field we won't move it it's, it's never gonna move yeah you're like but it's but we had people that would bring in games with fried coils flipper yeah. coils, board that obviously didn't burn there at the show kind of thing like you know the game doesn't work you merely brought a game in hopes that the technicians there would repair it possibly for free pinball ers is there to help out a lot of people to get their games up and going and so and I, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but there are people out there that have brought games that do not work, and they know they do not work. And it's just like, why would you even do that? I mean, it, wow, they're being cheap, too, so get rid of them. It's like you're putting in the effort to, like, haul a game to the show, and people will say that's pretty hardcore to, like, a lot of effort to put into bringing a game to a show. And I'm like, well, it's not so much that they're bringing the game just to get a free ticket. They're bringing the game and also hoping that it'll get repaired. Yeah. What's well, there kind of thing. For free. Yeah. This, uh, so that we had a lot more games that were up and running this year. Yeah. Or some of the previous. What is, um, did you win an award with Earthshaker? Uh, yes. I got a runner up for best, uh, 80s early solid state. We, we didn't think we were going to win on Future Queen, which we did. We won best original, mm -hmm. uh, which was a rare game, uh, which was strange that we won best original. Like, we didn't understand that. Uh, like, cause it's a bell games from, uh, Italy, but I guess that's original. I don't know. We were just happy we got a plaque. I mean, that was really kind of cool. Yeah, like my, my goal, knowing I wasn't going to get a best of show at work. I know the best of show, it requires, uh, a lot of work, not two months like that I did of this will have to do mentality kind of thing. It, and so when I got the best of show for my getaway, I mean, that took multiple years yeah where it had to so i knew like there's no way i'm going to get best of show i've already saw some of the games that were going to be in competition i'm not sure if you saw the batman forever that was i did that was really, really uh, nice. pictures of underneath the play field and all that kind of stuff i'm like oh man i don't i mean i can't judge by pictures alone but i know that you're definitely in the running for an award i was like but I'm, from what i can tell so far kind of thing so i knew what some of the competition was it was going to be overall better than mine so my only goal was to hopefully earn something in the 80s category. I mean, best 80s would have been like the top tier. Oh my gosh, that would have been my best case scenario. So a runner up in the 80s, I'm like, I, yeah, I met my goal. So that's that's when that's what I did. So I was like, all right, good. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. Absolutely. You, you busted it. It's a beautiful machine. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I went and saw it and you weren't there. And I didn't uh, really want to bang on it or anything, but I just wanted to like, you know, just look at the art and look at the, look at the play field. It's, it's really it's beautiful. And then uh, what uh, the decals? My brother recreated those. Really, one of those where I was like, I was like, I want new decals because a lot of people don't know this, but some people do. Like they do create black decals for Earthshaker. I think Retro Refurbs has them, and I'm not sure if it's a 
purposeful mistake or it's there for licensing issues. But they have the uh, state, Nevada and California, mirrored. So they kind of like do that on the back box where the states are facing the other direction. And in order for the art to match, they just basically mirror them. So the states are facing the wrong direction. Okay. And they're not like that on the original. And so so the black ones that they create, they're mirrored. And I'm like, I don't want that. So I had him, I was like, I was like hey, can you make it to where they're as close as possible to the original? I, I need the states facing the right direction and stuff like that. And so he even did a little bit more than that by making it a little bit. I was like, he wanted to do a lot more. And I was like, no, I can't can't go too modern on the game like this. I was like, you just want to add like, you know, other stuff in the background and everything, making it look all modernized. I'm like, no, I don't need all that fancy stuff. I was like, you know, the, so I think the most he did was just a slight little glow around the cracks, but that was about it. But so it's th these little nuances. If you want your, your pin to be recognized as a best in show or to win in a category, it's these little nuances that you really need to pay attention. It's like the difference between like competitive barbecue and just cooking in behind your house right yeah i mean and that's the thing it's it's uh, I, I don't i don't even want to call it a blessing but it's more of a curse uh, when i look at a lot of machines and you see all the details or things that could look better and so and this is something whether the people that compete want to admit it or not we do this we walk around the show and we kind of pinpoint out other machines that are definitely going to be in the running for against us kind of thing and so we kind of look at them and say, you're like, oh, well, you know what? They didn't do this, or this is not too clean here. And you you see all the little mistakes uh, or things that, that could have looked better. And definitely I could look at my earth shaker, I, and I know people who do their own restorations can look at their own game and know what could be better. And the thing is, a lot of things people aren't going to see, but those that did the restoration, they're going to see everything. And they know what could have been better kind of thing. So it's it's a curse when looking at games that are even brand new, and that's why some of the things I criticize about them are just so critical because a lot of the times it's the small, minute details. And But you're coming from that restoration prop, you know, brain where you're saying, okay, this has to look better. I got to make this look better. And when a Stern comes out with a new Jaws or whatever, it doesn't matter, and then you see these little things, it, it's got to drive you nutty, right? A little bit. It's it's one of those things where a part of me is like, oh, they could have done this, but it, it all comes down to cost. I mean, the, the, the bottom line yeah. always comes down to, especially from a manufacturing that are just constantly printing these games, copy paste, and get them out the door to people kind of thing. They can't spend hours and hours putting a game together, like mass making these like Stern does and making them each one flawlessly with no issues. I wish they could. I mean, but I mean, luckily the games that I've got from Stern, they have been good out of the box. So, but there's, there's mistakes that get made out there. So, uh, last thing on the restoration side, what's your next project? Do you, do you know? Uh, I'm leaning towards a particular one and I haven't really said like put a stamp on it just yet but i'm leaning towards uh swords of fury we we just got a swords and it's like it's one of those that you don't see very often oh man we just got one in and uh tim bought one and it's not a good competitive pinball game mm -hmm. for competitive because of what it is a there's a randomness to bonuses mm -hmm. Or random things in that game that you just don't even want to shoot for that are there. Like, yeah, their U-shaped flasher area right there. Why I I hammered that last night in the max <laughs> match, but it got me nothing. Yeah, it's like it's like you can hit that all the time. It's not going to really give you. I was just hammering it and hammering it. I think the the for that game's uniqueness, it's definitely the music that really uh, highlights for a lot of people on that kind of thing. I remember playing it for the first time at TPF many years ago, and what turned me on to it was definitely the music. It was simple, but it also had a really good beat to it kind of thing. And I think it's, for those that know the game Swords of Fury, you immediately highlight the soundtrack. It's like, it's like that's one of the best parts of the game. Oh, definitely. We have ours cranked, but, you know, when there's, there's 24 in here now, you can't hear it all the time, but... But I'm leaning towards that one. Uh, my brother is already basically, he's redone uh, some of the art for that one, but kept it pretty close to the original. Um, it's it's on the list. I haven't put a little stamp on, definitely it's going to happen. But i got other things in the works, other people that are cool. you know, tribute to it and stuff too. I got to uh, play, we'll go one more thing on TPF. I got to play Centaur uh, and view it about five, 
I saw your unboxing, you did the video and then you left, right? So then I walked up to it with a couple of guys and I gotta say, I mean, the cabinet, the art, you know, there's a mirror on the back that says Haggis, which I don't understand why they put that there. I guess when it's back down. There's a lot of things where I'm like, they don't have to do if it's too much money, where you, again, with the fine details portion, I'm like, why do they have this? Like, like you, you don't need that kind of thing. So, yeah, they, they, like, yeah, it does look pretty, but when are you ever going to see it kind of thing? I guess folded down, you could see the Haggis logo, and I was like, it's pretty damn nice. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's it, like I said, when it comes to details, there are certain things that uh, it's, it's a beautiful game. Yeah. For one of the things that uh, I guess bothers me about their cabinet style is that where you had the cabinet upright and you're moving it for the dolly or whatever, there's no standoffs on it. So if you're moving the cabinet around, basically it can be scuffed up and everything on the floor. They don't have anything to protect that side of the cabinet that they're trying to make look pretty. Okay. Logo and everything on. I'm like, uh, you think they'd have some kind of plastic standoffs, but I guess they kind of want to make it more pretty by not having the standoffs there it's pretty uh i'll tell you this right now though and and we're we done with with haggis okay if i walked through tpf and i did detective work and saw haggis hanging down uh, like you did <laughs> okay i would have streamed the shit out of it i would have unboxed it okay yeah i would have like... brought i tell you this carrie i would have brought my rig down from the tournament room upstairs with three ZV1s, and I would have had that thing surrounded. Yeah. And I would have kicked out, and they would have had to kick me out of there because I would have streamed it all night. We would have put dollar games on it. We would have had a whole thing. Yeah, it's it's one of those where, especially you don't know the condition of something. You know, a game that people are anticipating and hoping that they're going to get. They have We haven't seen one in person. It arrives on its side, pretty much. It's like, you're just going to go, well, oh, I'll check it out tomorrow, or you could be like, like mm. and might be able to see this tonight, maybe kind of thing. You know, it's like it's like this is something that's just your only mistake was not getting the rig and coming to me at our wormhole booth out front and getting the rigs because I would have brought two rigs. We would have double rigged it. You know, people wanted me to play it. I'm like, you don't want to see me play. I was like, I was like, I was like that wasn't really the purpose of it, though. I mean, you know. Um. So anyway, let's switch to this. Is a good segue to criticism because I like to talk to content creators about how they handle criticism. And I just had Colin Alzheimer on from the Kineticist. And I really enjoyed my interview with his wife. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's pretty familiar with getting criticism. He's pretty darn familiar with it. Right. And so I asked him, I said, you know, very similar. How do you handle criticism? And he was really candid about it, that it, like it almost took him out of the hobby. And, you know, that's not what we want, right? So, I mean, how do you deal with criticism? Do you, because do you ignore it? Do you handle it straight on? I, I think criticism, it, that's the thing, and I try to tell on this to people that are interested in getting into not so much the hobby, but if they want to get into creating any kind of content that allows people to openly give you comments or criticism because you can't please everybody. And, we always want to be able to make everybody happy, but sadly, you can't. It just can't be done. So, yeah. like, even if I was to, like, you know, I don't know, give away money on a stream or whatever, anybody that didn't get money is going to be upset or whatever. Or, I mean, give a suitcase full of money to somebody, they're going to be mad that the suitcase wasn't the correct color. So, it's like... It's like Dude, I said that joke. I said that joke all the time. If you give someone a bar of gold, that complain it's too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when it comes to criticism, I mean, that's you have to have thick skin. You have to. I mean, and it's, I think in this day and age, and you have certain creators, and I, I won't mention them here, but you have certain content creators that literally um, block out, block, delete comments, whatever, if in their mind it's negative or criticism. It's like they just don't even allow it. Yeah. And that's what I'm against is like that because. I try to teach my kids that basically, you know, there are people out there and this is how you're going to have to deal with it kind of thing. But if you just want to completely disregard and ignore, meaning like you're just going to like, I don't want to see it. Either you can just block it out and not see it, or you can learn to manage it, deal with it and make it make you stronger kind of thing. So when you have certain people that just delete comments 
or block people because they said something that they don't agree with, it's you're you're never going to learn from it. You're never going to get thicker skin. Everyone that's listening to you that knows me is like, oh, Jamie, you're in trouble. <laughs> no. Jamie, you're in trouble. No, it's like, because I have the thinnest skin in, in, in America. I mean, it's, and I'm a New Yorker. He it, grew up getting his balls busted on a weekly basis. You just, you just have to uh, uh, just get used to it. And, and it's one of those things that whenever I post a video up, I know I'm not going to make everybody happy and I'm going to make some people mad. But it's also the fact that I post it up and then after it's there, I've got another life. This is not my primary source of income is creating content or videos and everything. Yeah. I mean, so I don't really have to focus on this. I still love pinball and love creating content for pinball. But it's like, like someone can post a comment. And as long as you remember that a lot of the times that is merely a momentary thing in their day was posting a little comment and it's merely them hiding behind a picture that's not even them or whatever, completely anonymity to be able to hopefully aggravate you or make you mad or upset kind of thing. And it's like the moment that you acknowledge the trolls, I'll say that, and feed them, they they always say never feed the trolls. The moment that you give them something, that's when they know they've got you. That's whenever it's like, oh, yeah, and then they're going to double down on it because you gave them attention, and that's all it is. It's a, a, some of them are just jealous of the fact that you've got attention and they don't. What can make where they get some attention also? How about some negative energy kind of thing? Let's throw it yeah. in. And it's like, like I said, it's just a moment for them just to post something and they're going to go about their day. But That's a good, if you reply to it, then yeah. like a whole new thing. So it's like, I mean, I don't, I don't comment back on all the comments I get. I leave the comments up that are there. Because I'm all about say what you want, go ahead. As long as it's not like this pure up, just you know, racist or anything like that, then yeah, I'll leave comments up. And you got to take the good with the bad. And I, I think it's just a moment, a, a thing where it's. I I would hate to say what I say, like just openly talk about what I talk about, and then reject anybody that doesn't agree with me. I don't want to live in an echo chamber. I I like being able to go back and forth with someone about something that we possibly don't agree on because I think that would be a learning experience for both of us. So even just recently with a flipping out stream, I was going to do a stream that night and talk about my experience with the TPF and go about it. But Joel offered for me to come on there and to talk with all of them. And I was like, yes, I would much rather be able to talk to three or four of you guys and go back and forth with chat than just doing a video and talking to a camera kind of thing. Yeah. Like to go back and forth with people. I don't believe that my my comments or my ideas are the best. It's just like, this is just how I feel. And I, I don't lie about anything because I don't want to have to remember what I said. Right. I don't like how a game shoots. And I just don't like how it shoots. It doesn't make the game bad. It just means it's just not for me. We have a tough time with that here. You know, the criticism part. Uh, not that we receive criticism. I need criticism. Uh, I, if my sound's off, if something's wrong with one of our streams, I need to know. Because okay? I, 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 I'm a producer for them, for these people playing pinball, really. Uh, that's really what we do most of the time. I, I just do this podcast because I like it. I like doing podcasts. <laughs> but uh, I have a tough... Oh, I was just, I was going to say, I was, I, for me, it's like, it's the negative comments that don't bother me. But if it's negative comments and they're right those actually bug me a little bit i'm like well you know what he's right yeah <laughs> so there's a good one about you if they're wrong i'm like i don't care you're wrong i know you're so, wrong so i don't care so we kind of hit the scene during covid but one how we kind of got a name for ourselves one more people kind of found out who we were was uh the labyrinth video and we did uh they filmed the labyrinth uh, re- reveal Bo and Karen's here and then they filmed the teaser video with a girl kind of leaning and walking up to the machine mm-hmm. so they filmed them here this place is dark yes okay it's that the- from the first Bo and Karen's playthrough out huh? okay <laughs> so the first Bo and Karen's playthrough you go on and said it was too dark yeah right and I knew it was too dark 
<laughs> but I'm not an audio video <laughs> lighting idiot. I'm just the guy that opened the door, right? And brought, gave him my stream, my rig. It was too dark. That drove me bananas for a good solid week. You're, it was too dark because you were right. And I was like, 10,000 people watched this and it didn't do justice to the machine because it was too dark. And we can't let that happen again. Uh, and so I might have gone on stream a few times and said, hey, how's the, my lighting? Uh, to joke with people, but you were right. It, it, is, it, it is hard to hear, but damn it, it was too dark in here. And we got to make sure. So I bought a bunch of lights. And, you know, if we ever do a, a big stream like that, I can put the play field with better lighting because that's what killed it. And then we need that needs four cameras because with their small little uh the labyrinth you know what i mean the other uh screen mm -hmm. you got to show everything in that machine and i just don't think that that stream that it just didn't do it and that uh, that's the thing i think that all streamers and or people that are creating content in general it's like whatever your primary focus is on your your objective is to make the product or the game at its best yeah and so it's one of those things where in cameras are finicky when it comes to recording and what may look like as proper lighting and what you're actually going to be seeing whenever you put it into like my premiere when I'm editing and just recently I was doing some stuff or it looked good at the time and then I put it into the program and I'm like that looks way too bright or that looks way too dark and it's like you have to make all kinds of like you know adjustments to the camera and the lens and stuff like that and but when it comes to streaming definitely it's like you have to be able to see the where the ball is at on their kind of you got to see it all. You want to show off the art. You want to show off everything. Mm -hmm. I still think that Labyrinth and Barrels of Fun had an excellent launch. They're the up and comers in pinball. I like that. Like they, regardless of the dark stream or whatever, that didn't hinder the ability for them to sell more games. No, it's a beaut. All it did was want to, them to see more just with better lighting. See, we just did it on purpose. We are just trying to tease you all. Exactly. That was a crazy time for us because here we are with this kind of private pinball club that's open on three days a month. And then we get a call uh, from our friend Travis Mosman, who's now an engineer there. He left uh, Aerosmith and he's a full time engineer at Barrels. And he says, I have, you have to sign an NDA. Uh, I'm coming over and you have to sign an NDA. Now I'm a, in a staffing business, I signed NDAs before. and you know, I usually like to know what it's about before I sign an NDA. And when they told us what was happening with Labyrinth and, you know, after we signed the NDA and that they wanted to do it here with Bowen, I mean, I should have brick. I was just so excited for them. But they did it under our noses. I mean, for years. Yeah. And, and they, then, kept, they kept quiet. I mean, they were pretty tight-lipped. No one knew what was going on. I was surprised. I mean, when certain they started releasing little teases and everything, he started getting the puzzles put together. He's like, could it be? Yeah. But uh, even though the puzzles equal to be possibly Labyrinth, I was like, I just don't see a company that no one knows getting that license kind of thing. It's, it's like, I, I just don't see that happening. And sure enough, there it is. There it is. I think they created the a great world under glass for Labyrinth. I was like, that's what we want in pinball is to create that theme and put everything up underneath glass. And the new code's good. Yeah, well, I, I still got to play more on it. A buddy of mine, he bought one, and he's also got a barbecue that I'm going to get more time on before I start getting a lot of uh, feedback for that one. But yeah, um, but with Labyrinth, I remember the first time I played at the Expo last year, and you know, and and David walked up to me, and uh, it was like I was about to say something, and he was like, he's like, let me just start caring by saying I don't care if you like the game, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, he has a good start. This is the first time that me and David have ever like spoke to each other. He's like, "But how did we do on this theme?" And like, I was, I was like, "Dude, you, you nailed it." I was like, "You, you got a great theme, and everything underneath the glass looks good." He didn't care if I liked how it shot, which is completely understandable because that's going to be subjective, like nobody's business kind of thing. But he wanted to make sure that they got the theme and some assets and all that kind of stuff underneath the glass. And I think if they keep that mentality of just, you know what, we want to bring this particular license, this particular theme, and just pack a game as much as we can, along with 
putting it a, hopefully a good layout. But uh, I think they're definitely going to focus on getting the assets and bringing a theme to life under. Yeah. I think they're. I think the future's bright for those guys. I'm a, again, I'm pretty damn by it. This is where I would say an asterisk or I would say the opinions of the wormhole do not necessarily represent. <laughs> <laughs> the thoughts, opinions of the wormhole do not properly represent. You know what I mean? But they work. Uh, they come here and we know them all. And I know from David to Travis to the guys who put the screws in and, and Phil Grimaldi did the rules. We, we love them. And I'm so pumped to see what the next theme is. I, I haven't been signed under NDA to that, so I can't really, <laughs> I don't know, but you know, they're pretty excited about what's happening down there. So I, I think definitely it was one of those where people were completely surprised about what they could do. And I've spoken about this recently when it comes to reputations and pinball. And I think the one thing that was against them was that people didn't know who they were. Right. The, the trust. Like, do I, do, am I going to get a game if I order from these people? Do they know how to make a pinball machine? And they just came out swinging. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, they brought out so many games to Expo. What was it 10 machines that they had there? Boxes ready to go. And they were just showing off the topper that was already there. I mean, it was like, they were just like, we know what the community wants. We have been in the community. We have, you know, whether it be worked in the spooky area of pinball and stuff, we have a good idea of what people want. They want a game to launch and they want it to be ready now. They want the games in boxes and be shipped out. And now that they have proven that they can do that, their next game whether it's a slam park theme or not, I think that their sales are going to be great because they've already got a reputation of knowing that they're going to get a game out ASAP. And from what I've heard so far, their like um, customer service is top notch. It it is. Yeah, from a couple of people that I've spoken to, they're like they're like yeah, they got back with me the same day or whatever, whatever, and yeah, it's been resolved and stuff like. That. We were lucky because we put it on location here, and so when they come here, and one of them is our TD. And if he sees a, a bolt not tight enough, he fixes it. So this is number 26 right here, and it is perfect. It's always going to be perfect, those guys. So God bless you. Like David invited me out there, uh, TPF. He's like, he's like, yeah, man, come on, man. You know, I, I was like, I was like, all right. I mean, so I don't have a date set. I went, you should. You know, I haven't even gotten, I haven't gotten the tour yet, bastard. I'll, I'll see if I can schedule up something maybe next month and go check out what's well, I mean, if you're going to be in Houston, you might as well stop by the wormhole. Yeah, exactly. I and mean, see what we've got going on here. A uh, couple more questions for you, and then I'll get you out of here. Um, one, we'll, we'll deal with criticism one more time. Okay. How has anyone you've criticized a company and CEO or somebody come to you and say, "Hey, how, how do you handle that?" <laughs> it's it's always a funny slightly awkward moment when I walk up to a particular designer yeah, or coder for that matter. We meet up at Expo. We go to a restaurant. It, 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 this is what's funny is that I'm well aware that I I have a, a face that a lot of people that don't know me want to punch. I don't know. It, 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 yeah. like, I'm, well, I'm well aware of this. It's like I always joke that if me and the wife... I'm laughing with you. Okay, <laughs> I promise you. I'm well aware of that. It's like, so I, I always joke and I always say that if me and my wife were like forced to be in a class together in college and everything to where she had to be around me and get to know me, then we wouldn't be married with children or anything like that now and stuff like that. Because it's like, I, I'm not an instant like, and that for YouTube, that sucks because a lot of the times you basically just get one chance. You get no. one video and if they don't like you or don't like the way you look, don't like your mannerisms, your accent or whatever, then it's just like, yeah, I'm not going to watch this guy anymore kind of thing. And it's like, and I still get the negative comments here and there, but it's like once these people actually meet me, discuss pinball, go back and forth, they're like, oh, okay, he may just, he looks like an asshole, but he's not kind of thing, you know? So it's like, it's like I'm not as bad as a lot of people might think I am. And I have met people in some of the bigger manufacturers and then they shake my hand and like, Oh yeah, this is over. They're like, Oh, I know who you are. I, I don't, I don't like you. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, let's, at least you're honest. I, I don't get mad. But after we sit down, we have a meal, we go back and forth. And now we are joking around with each other at TPF and everything and stuff, you know, and I bet other people too, we've shaked hands. Sure. 
and they said they enjoyed my comment. I don't think your criticism it comes from a place. This is where I like you. I don't think it comes from a place where you're trying to get clicks. Mm-hmm. Okay, that it's bologna and cheese. I think it comes from a place where you're saying, "Hey, this can be better." Well, can I hold you accountable for it? And that there's nothing wrong with that, right? I just don't have the bologna's to do it. And so what we do at the wormhole is when we have a machine that comes through here from, let's just say, a manufacturer that's getting a lot of flack mm-hmm. and it's not working, I'm just not going to stream it. So when they call me and they say, hey, you haven't streamed this. I'm like, well, yeah, it's just not working. You want it to break? I mean, I know I only get a couple hundred people, but do you want it to break? Yeah. While they're watching, that's not going to help your sales because that might get me more views. It's like, <laughs> it's like we could reminisce about the days of GTF during the streams and stuff like that. It doesn't help. That's a hell. It's like, it's, it's, that's the thing is that, like, like you said, when you're streaming the game, the one of your main objectives is to represent the product to its best abilities, kind of thing. And it, the game breaking down in the middle of the stream, and you have to constantly take the glass off. Every time you take that glass off, it's not good, kind of thing. And yeah, so, but like, yeah, dealing with the criticism kind of thing, it's like, yeah, I, I don't harp on any particular company more than others. I don't think I do at least. And if I do, it's not due to malice intent. Okay. And it's like, I, cause every company, they got to do what they've got to do. Every company, whether they want to admit it right now is struggling. The economy yeah. is the way it is. Every company is trying to figure out a way to get money out of our pockets into theirs in order for them to stay alive. And it's 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 funny to me that just some people don't know that yet but talking to people in the industry it's there they don't know that the 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 market is soft the way it is when it comes to selling used games the new games aren't selling as much as they were during covid because people are being much more picky about what they're buying where their money is going i think if a machine is going to sell great then it needs to check every box that does. I mean, especially... Also, they don't have room. People don't have room. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. So, up, upcoming game towards the end of the year, I'm probably going to finally be able to sell or get rid of some of the other games because i got to make room for that. And yeah. it's like, that's where it's gotten for me, is like space, real estate, you know? So, mm-hmm. I've got to get rid of a game or two to put another game in here kind of thing. And I'm trying my damnedest to not impulse buy... Uh, or sell one of my games to get me an Iron Maiden for whatever reason. I am like champing at the bit right now to play Iron Maiden because I was playing it at TPF and I was like, I don't know why. I just want to play this game. I love Iron Maiden. Yeah. Because it's great. Music. And I'm like, it ain't about the music. It's just how it plays. And I love how it plays. And if for whatever reason, I just really want to play that game some more. Just play Run to the Hills a hundred times. Who gives a shit? Run to the Hills is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like run to the hell? <laughs> oh, fly to Icarus. And I'm like, I'm like oh, I know. No, I'm that ramp to the pops is the, the bane of that game. It's like, I can't ever hit it. I know. That's true. What? Uh, I see a World Cup soccer in the back. Yeah. That's my favorite. That's my first machine. I was telling Colin, Colin uh, Alzheimer has one too. Just realized I had the beat. Still left the pin shield on that one for whatever reason there. Now it looks a little better behind me. Oh, uh, I just. <laughs> It just speaks to me. Like, yep. What machine are you playing more these days? What's speaking to you? I've been going lately back and forth between Deadpool and Foo Fighters. Um, and it's like I'm going back and forth. And I, I, I guess a part of me, because the, one of the main reasons why I got a Deadpool was because the local family center that has a Deadpool, the machine's been broken. I haven't been able to thoroughly enjoy it. I'm like, well, if I can't. I wanted to get my Deadpool fixed, but if I can't play on a game that's working, then I'll just get the damn game myself. They've recently fixed their game. So I'm like, hmm, now that I can go there to get my Deadpool fixed, maybe I might trade Deadpool for something. I don't know. We'll see. But it's like, as of right now, I've been kind of going back and forth because the 1.0 code came out for Foo Fighters, and I thought I knew how to play that game. I don't know how to play it. Yeah, but the new the new code, if you don't know how to play it, it'll tell you how to play it. It's really better, right? The dude tells you what to do. I know. I just, like I said, I thought I knew how to play it, and then all of a sudden he's like, shoot this to get that. I'm like, I know. Honestly, I <laughs> Why can't I have an Alexa on every single game? Yeah. I would be so much better than 2350th in the world in competitive film. Like, Hold my hand. Let me show you how to play this game kind of thing. We want to play a game. We want to have a tournament here where we have a caddy. 
and the caddy stands next to you basically doing Alexa moves, telling you where to shoot. They're like, all right, what, are you, what you're shooting for right now? Yeah, don't shoot. Yeah, what you see in this horseshoe on the Swords of Fury, you're wasting yeah. your time here, Jane. Yeah, yeah, dude, you, it looks pretty, the flashers, yeah, but you're, you're getting no point. Because we just got, hey, Star Wars premium in. Okay. And John bought it because he got sick and tired of kids beating us in competitive pinball on it because we don't know what the hell we're doing. Yeah. And within really 30 minutes of playing it and knowing that you have to move the multiplier to the shot that you want to hit, mm -hmm. that's a game changer. I see people play that, and it's like it's almost a whole workout. It, it, uh, it's like I've seen people just hitting that damn action button, going back and forth, and it's just like, I'm like, that seems like a lot of work to play. It is a lot of work to figure it out, but once you do, that can be a fun game. Mm -hmm. It is, but it, you have to be able to press the, the multiplier, and then you're blowing up high fighters. There's a lot of shit on that front button, but anyway. Uh, you don't play competitive pinball, do you? I did one tournament. I think I still had my little trophy over here. But, uh, yeah. Look at that. Second place? Uh, Barry Osler's uh, second place C division. So, um, you know, we can cross that C yeah, out. This is 2022. That's the only, like, official, like, tournament that I've ever been in. And that's when I learned that it's, it's not for me. It, it, it's like I am way too impatient. It's like you have all these machines in front of me. And it's like, I have to wait my turn to play or whatever kind of thing. I'm like, I want to play now. And it's like, yeah. my attention span is so, uh, you know, short these days as well as a lot of people's. And it's just like, uh, it's like, I have to stand there and wait. Kind of. I take my kids riddle and, and uh, it really helps to the competitive. No, I don't, uh, I, but I should. <laughs> but you're right. It is a lot of sitting and waiting around uh, for your turn. It's weird here because really our capacity is 50 people. So we ask people to sit outside because uh, it just gets too crammed in here, especially in June, July. But as we're growing, and I think they're doing a big article on us in, in a big magazine, and that's not going to be good for us. And when it comes to competition, I mean, you know, the, the, especially in, in when you're playing the game, some people take it very seriously. And it's like, it, it, it depends on where oh, yeah. their mindset's at, you know, and I, I find myself someone that can find a joke anywhere or likes to but i mean i'm not gonna go over there and tickle you while you're playing or anything like that but you know i i mean i'm, I'm i might be a little vocal or whatever and some people you know they need to full concentration got their e earphones on or whatever and this is like they are there to do this nothing else kind of thing and it's just like okay i mean so to, uh, not everyone's like that in the no no listen it's a good community it's just it's a different, it's a time suck, mm -hmm. number one. And it is, if you're not competitive and you're just here to party, you, there's there's a balance. I try to stick in the middle. Yeah. And then that's where, I, that's where I feel like I'd be, I would be much more of a casual tournament guy. Like, all right, carries your turn. Like, all right. And if I lose, oh, man. And that's the thing also. I got to usually watch my language. A lot of the times if I'm really into a game and I'll blurt out a curse word loud and then it's like, oh, you can't You could swear like, here, I think. <laughs> I swear. We got a couple of kids, but they know the deal. They know the dealio. Dallas is a little more serious. The DFW, they tell us not to swear in front of the kids. I don't want to drop an f bombs or anything, but a little shit once in a while. Uh, before uh, before we leave, is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, I mean, I guess the only thing to plug is basically you can find me on YouTube, uh, Carrie Hardy on YouTube. I mean, you can Google Carrie Hardy and pay yeah, and he comes right on up. He's a first pager. I think it's the first thing. You guys can figure that out. It's not real hard. Uh, have you ever been to the Houston Arcade Expo? Uh, no. I tell people the people tell me every year. I get handed the 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 pamphlets and all that kind of stuff every year at TPF. I know one of the guys that uh, helps run the place and stuff. But it's like uh, it's usually like right after the expo in Chicago. Yeah, it is. And it's like it's like I already use PTO and everything when it comes to work for that whole weekend. And it's like, man, it's like maybe I might schedule off a Saturday or sometime to go actually down there and visit it because I, I hear that it's mainly a party. Well, I think it's an expo kind of masked as a party or a party mass as an expo. Maybe that's where that's the first. Yeah. I hear it's more of a party than any anything else. It just says it's a party with a bunch of pinball machines in our. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I don't know what to say. What what could be wrong? I say it's horrible. Everybody's like, he's like, oh, you got to go, you got to go. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, maybe I can get down there. For the joint is a, like, you should come on a Saturday, 
right? Spay in one night, drive back Sunday afternoon because you're going to sleep in because you'll be up till two or three in the morning playing pinball. I mean, Scott Denisi is a DJ and he's awesome. <laughs> he's awesome. Yeah. I guess I'm mass dude with an RE 2600 making music. I mean, how do you beat that? It, it's RE 20. <laughs> he does. He has an RE 20. He, it's some guy named Atari 2600 guy, not Denisi. Some guy named. That's how I'm like, what? I've never seen him do that. No, no, no. He does uh, his uh, switch, whatever, the board. And, yeah, he's got all uh, kinds of. He's got all kinds of shit that he does. He's he's unbelievable. But some guy in, called Atari 2600 Matt or Matt Atari or something gets up there and jams it, whatever. Uh, well, you need to, one day when you do come to Houston, if you do go to the barrels, come to the wormhole. We are building a museum here. It's going to be called Wormhole East. It's a 14,000 square foot building that's going to be in downtown. And it is going to be called the Wormhole East Museum or something to that extent. And we'll have 125 pens, some that the world's never seen. Wow. And it's going to be honestly a destination. And, and it's another reason why we just want to spread the love for pinball and what we show people this unbelievable collection that, that Tim and John have. So yeah. like, I'd like to go to the pinball museum in Vegas. It's like, but I'll be, I've been hearing mixed reviews about it. Yeah. That's a, that's a no for you. <laughs> so I'll be critical of them yeah. and that would be <laughs> because nothing ever works. And the lady in there is just the meanest human being on the planet. Do you think you have resting? <laughs> 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 I know I've got resting bitch face. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it. Why, why are you so mad? I'm, I'm not mad. I'm just thinking. No, no, no. Real, just. She's the that lady's the Google image of it. Uh, she's just miserable, and you know, kids running around, and then no running. I mean, they're kids. They're gonna run. It's a pinball place. They're excited, and nothing ever works. And no, this place is gonna be unbelievable. And if you, anyone that's ever been to the wormhole, take that 2.0 is going to be just an unbelievable. And, and if anyone that knows Christine Booth is going to be designing it, they know it's going to be awesome. So that like, will be a ribbon cutting in 2026 that you're going to have to come down to use. It's not that far. Five hours. I plan on, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get a hold of uh, David over there at Barrels and see if uh, I could schedule sometime in May to go down there and visit. And while I'm down there, I'll hit you. Absolutely. Might even hit up Turner Pinball. I mean, they're, cause they're down there as well and stuff just to see what. They're in San Antonio, right? Yeah, they're not too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's less. Yeah, just make a loop. <laughs> make a loop. Uh, Carrie, thanks again for coming on the podcast. It was a lot of fun, man. I really enjoyed it. Please visit Carrie Harder on YouTube and all the socials. Please keep up all the good work that you're doing, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. This was fun. Thanks. All right.